we're going to talk about what happens. And this, this has happened probably to everyone, every single person. There's been a time where your mind has been hijacked, right? It's been hijacked under pressure. Now, what do we mean when we say hijacked? Well, what we mean is that you're going into a higher or high pressure speaking situation. And this can be anything from a conversation with a superior. Um, for some people, it could be something as simple as ordering coffee, <clears throat> right? Or going through the drive through But for many, it'll be something like making a presentation, an interview, a meeting, uh, a review, a meeting where there's uh, where the stakes are high or there are stakeholders there. So anything that's high pressure for you, when you go into that, you probably have experienced cloudy mind where all of a sudden you can't quite remember what it is that you want to say. Like you prepared for it, you know what you want to say, but you can't quite remember it. It starts to get foggy. Your heart rate increases. Now, this has happened to me, even though I've done so many presentations and sermons and taught them. Uh, one time, several years ago, I went to do a presentation in front of a larger audience, and I hadn't been presenting in a while, and my heart rate had increased dramatically. But I wasn't afraid. I was actually looking forward to it because I volunteered for it, and I love to speak, and I love audiences, but that didn't stop my heart rate from increasing. And this is very important for you to understand that sometimes you have to ignore what your body's doing, right? So just because your heart rate has increased doesn't mean that you can't perform well. And I'm going to share with you a couple of very, very specific strategies that you can use when that happens. But just keep that in mind. So heart rate can increase. Uh, you can begin to shake, right? You can begin to shake, maybe not like this, but but you're but you might just get like little tremors. Your knees or your legs can start to tremble, right? You can start feeling something in your stomach. Some people actually feel a thickness and tightness in their chest. Some people feel something happening in their throat, right? You can start to sweat. You might have to go to the bathroom, okay? Uh, what are some other things that can happen? Well, you will begin to rush. You'll want to get it over with. How many times, in fact, I heard someone say this last night, I just want to get this over with, right? So your mind says that I just want to get through this, which means I want to rush, I want to hurry and get through this, which means you're going to be speaking fast. You're going to be rushing. Keep that in mind because we're going to talk about that later. All right. So these are some of the things, if not most of the things, that can happen to people when your mind gets hijacked. So let's talk about, well, before we talk about why that happens. When this happens, the results can be that, number one, you forget what you want to say or you forget some of what you want to say. Number two, you can rush. You can speak really fast. And therefore, you're not clearly articulating your thoughts, what you want to say. You're not having the impact that you want. You're not adding the value. You're not being relevant. You're not able to be as clear as you would like. These are some of the results. Now, when that happens, then the people around you don't understand what you're saying. They're not receiving it well. You're not projecting calmness, smoothness, confidence. You may be very intelligent. In fact, you might be the most intelligent person there. But if you're not able to project that, then people aren't perceiving you. They're not receiving you that way. And this can, in fact, I talked to someone yesterday, this can and will and does impact your career progression, your career advancement. Does that make sense? Or it can impact your relationships, the kind of people that you have relationships with, their level of respect for you. This can impact your relationships with your colleagues and their level of respect for you, right? As well as your superiors and how capable they see you are when you allow your mind to get hijacked. So you see how important this is, right? All right. So 
let's talk now about why this happens. And then I'm going to give you, obviously, some specific strategies to help you. So we have our, our forebrain, we have our midbrain, and we have our hindbrain. We're mostly going to be talking about what happens in the forebrain and in the midbrain. So there's a there's an almond-shaped structure located in your midbrain, like right in the center, and it's called your amygdala. And you've probably heard of this before. And what happens is that your amygdala is there and has been there. It was there before the forebrain, but it's, it's there to monitor sensory information, right? So it's monitoring what you see. It's monitoring what you hear. It's monitoring touch, right? So it's monitoring what's going on in the atmosphere and the environment around you, right? Monitoring taste and so forth. And it also is connected with your memories and your emotions. And it's also connected to uh, other areas of your body, right? So that if it needs to, it can send signals to other parts of your brain to get your body moving and in motion. But one of the things that it does is it monitors your environment for perceived threats. Okay? For perceived threats. For perceived threats. Okay? So it monitors your environment for perceived threats. And when it does this, when it does this, it gets your body in motion. And we'll talk about that next. But so it's looking around and it's also interacting with your memories, right, of what's a perceived threat. So obviously many thousands of years ago, uh, humans had to deal with very, very real life, what do we want to call it, uh, life-threatening dangers, okay? So it could be a saber-toothed tiger or a lion or even another tribe or something, right? So these are very, very real dangers that were perceived by the amygdala. And so immediately the amygdala would hijack your thinking brain, right? And we'll talk about that a little bit more. But it's looking around for perceived dangers and it says, wait a minute, we're about to get eaten or we're about to get killed. And so we need to get into action right now. Your amygdala is talking to the rest of your body and your brain. It says, we need to get into action right now, right? So what's important to understand is as we bring this forward, there are times where we might uh, find ourselves in a life-threatening situation. For example, if a car is barreling down on you or you're about to get mugged or robbed or you're in some other life-threatening situation, your amygdala is immediately going to perceive that and it's going to get everything going so that you can fight or flee or in some cases freeze. Okay. And once again, we'll go into a little bit more detail, but that's what's happening. So it monitors perceived threats. Now, the next thing that it does is it's, it's monitoring, but once it sees a threat, and in this case, it could perceive a threat as being a presentation that's coming up, an important meeting or an interview right, or an important conversation. So your brain can perceive that as a threat. So it can go back and look at your memories and say, oh, this is what happened before. Or it can say, oh, wow, uh, I'm afraid that I'm going to feel or be judged, that I'm going to feel embarrassed, right? Or that I could be penalized somehow, right? So it's going to look back and say, wait a minute, uh, I could mess up here, right? I could fail here, I could be embarrassed. 
or I could be judged, or all three. And so it perceives that situation as a very, very real threat. When this happens, it does what we call, it activates, activates the amygdala. It activates it. So it puts it into action. And when this happens, it releases these chemicals, two specific ones, cortisol and adrenaline, cortisol and adrenaline. So it starts releasing, right, or activates the release of these two chemicals into your system, which heightens your awareness, but it does something else. It does something else. In your forebrain, it's what we call your prefrontal cortex, right? Your prefrontal cortex. This is your thinking brain. This is where you make decisions and choices. This is the brain that's able to access the information that you've prepared for that presentation or for that interview, for example. This is the brain that monitors, but also it is able to calm you down. It's able to keep you calm and keep you more relaxed so that you can think and that you can perform well. But when there's amygdala hijacking, it bypasses the prefrontal cortex, right? And begins to send signals to other parts of the brain so that you can take action. And the reason that this happens is because if a car is barreling down on you, for example, you don't have time to stand there and make decisions to say, huh, I wonder how fast that car is going. That's a nice car. I wonder what kind of car that is. I wonder if, if I'm actually going to be hit or if I can shift over this way or if he's going to go that way, right? You don't really have time to do that. The car is coming. Your senses perceive it, right? Your senses see it. It activates your amygdala and says, you're about to get hit. You don't have time to think about this. Get out of the way, like jump out of the way, okay? So, or if you're driving, you're about to be in an accident, you know that feeling where the adrenaline and cortisol, bam, it's been released. And you just, bam, you know, all of a sudden you can feel it in your body. You're like, oh my God, I almost just got killed. I almost just had an accident, right? That's what's happening. So then you're... you're the amygdala says, okay, get out of the way, jump back, jump forward, or whatever. So it sends signals to the parts of your body to actually increase your heart rate, increase your blood pressure. It sends signals to the muscles, right? It sends more blood to the muscles, which means it's taking blood away from other parts of your body, like your digestive system, your prefrontal cortex, your thinking brain is pulling resources and sending those resources to the parts of your body that needs to act, right, that needs to act. So this could mean stiffening up, bracing. This could mean having that feeling in your stomach or your chest or your throat. This could mean shallow and or rapid breathing, right? Obviously, increased blood pressure. I talked to a lady yesterday whose blood pressure was really high because she had a presentation to do. She has. And I talked to her a couple of weeks ago, gave her some tips, and she said, wow, that's really helped. It's helped my blood pressure come down. I feel a lot more relaxed because I now have these strategies, right? So these are all the things that happen, and that can happen to you when you are in a meeting or you're in an interview or you're in a conversation, right, or you're doing a presentation. All of these things can happen. You start to sweat. And you can become very stiff. You can want to get out of there. Like the person said, I want to get this done. I want to hurry up and get through this. So that causes you to start speaking fast. And if you just allow this amygdala hijacking, then you start to go cloudy, right? Your brain starts to go cloudy. Your prefrontal cortex starts to go cloudy. And you start to forget what you want to say. You're not able to articulate as clearly as you would like, add the value that you would like. Does this make sense, right? This is what's happening. So this hijacks, right? It pulls resources away from here and sends those resources to other parts of your brain and your body. 
And in some cases, people just freeze up and you can't say, you can't say anything. Right? You just can't say anything. Even people who've never started, they just freeze up when they're under pressure because of this amygdala hijacking. Now, what happens next? Well, the release of the release of these hormones, right? Hormones or chemicals. Okay. So we got your cortisol and we got your adrenaline that gets released. And then what happens next is the hijacking of your prefrontal cortex. I'm just going to repeat. The hijacking of your prefrontal cortex, which I just explained. This is, this is why this happens, right? This is what happens, and this is why it happens. It's because your amygdala, your brain, has perceived that this is a threat. It's perceived that I might fail, I might be embarrassed, I might be judged. And this can have an impact on my career, on my finances, on how people perceive me, on my relationship, on my status. So it perceives this as a threat, and then all of these things begin to happen to one degree or another, when your brain perceives those situations as threats. I hope that that makes sense. Now, when that happens, we have what we call impaired performance. Impaired performance. Okay. So you are simply unable to perform as well as you could, as well as you would like to. All right? So let's talk now about what you can do about this. I'm going to keep it very, very simple. Very, very simple. Just a few things that I want you to keep in mind of. For this part of the webinar, I want you to either take notes or come back, rewatch the webinar, <clears throat> excuse me, and take notes then, okay? And then put this into practice. Now, in that 30-day intensive, as well as in our other coaching programs, we deal with what I'm going to be sharing with you now, but we're going to specifically focus on these things in this 30-day smooth speech intensive coaching. We're going to focus on helping you kind of master the specific strategies and skills that we're going to go over today. And these are things that you've heard before, but that doesn't matter. You need to hear it again, and you need to see how this helps to regulate and to counter, to counter the amygdala hijacking. All right, we're also not going to talk today about things that you need to do before. I'm really going to focus in on what to do when it's happening or just before it's happening. Now, you can do these same things uh, in the days and the weeks and months leading up to, and there's lots of other things that you need to do. But we're really just going to focus on the moments before and when you're in it, okay? All right, two things, two things. One is be aware... Be aware, I'm going to use the word be, and you'll see why in just a minute. Be aware that just because your heart rate has increased, just because you're sweating, just because you feel anxious or nervous, and we want to reframe that and say, I feel excited, right? Just because this is happening to your body doesn't mean that you can't perform well. Again, I can recall when my heart rate increased, it felt like it was going to jump out of my chest. I was standing up before hundreds of people, and I just did deep breathing. And when I started, right, I'm kind of sharing with you what you need to do. When I started, I just spoke super slow, but I spoke proactively. So even though it was slow, it was impactful, it was engaging, <clears throat> right? And the reason I know it is because when I was done, People just came up to me and said, wow, your voice sounded so smooth. Uh, even though you spoke slow, you held my attention. So don't think that you have to speak fast to hold people's attention. Sure, some people are not going to like it. And that's fine. Some people are not going to like you when you speak fast. They're not going to. But you don't have to speak fast to hold people's attention. You don't have to be all over the place. So that's one thing. The other thing I did was I breathed to start to lower my heart rate, right, to lower my heart rate. So one of the first things that you want to do is to be aware that, hey, just because my body's doing this 
doesn't mean I can't perform well, right? So that awareness is what you are coming into right now. You're coming into the awareness that, hey, when I have something coming up and I feel my heart beating or I start to sweat, it doesn't mean that I can't do anything about it. It doesn't mean I can't perform well because I can't. So what can you do? Well, here's where this B comes in. Breathe. All right? You're going to breathe more frequently and more fully. Okay. So remember those two things. I'm going to put freak and full. Right? You're going to breathe more frequently and more fully. And you're going to do this if you can, leading up to that event or that experience, whatever it is, it's a meeting, it's an interview, it's a presentation, uh, it's ordering coffee, you're going to breathe more frequently. So breathe more. So that means you're going to need to be aware that you need to breathe. Be aware of your breathing. Okay, Breathe more frequently and breathe more fully. That means breathe deeper, take deeper breaths. The best way to do this is to breathe in through the nose, and out through the mouth, into the nose, out through the mouth. We have something called the 777. You can change those numbers if you want. But this allows you to breathe in through the nose, hold for a count of seven, breathe in for a count of seven. So you're, you're learning to control the rate of your inhalation. You're holding it for a count of seven. Some people eliminate that step. That's fine. And then you are exhaling or releasing the breath through your mouth for a count of seven. If you're using diaphragmatic breathing, your belly is coming out when you're breathing. When you're breathing in, right, your diaphragm, not really your chest, right? So you can hold here and you can make sure your belly is coming out for that count of seven. And then when you release the air, your diaphragm comes back in, okay? Something we call diaphragmatic breathing. So you breathe more frequently and fully. Just that simple thing can help to lower your heart rate, lower your blood pressure, and begin to send more oxygen and resources back to your prefrontal cortex so that you can begin to think more clearly, articulate your thoughts, say what you want to say. All right, the next thing, the next thing is related to this, and it is, and this, these are the two things that we are going to focus on in this 30-day intensive is to extend your words. So let's talk about what we mean when we say extend your words. This is, you know, some people call it stretching, elongating. I don't really like those words. I call it extending your words, extending your words. A couple of benefits. Number one, it is slowing you down. It's forcing you to slow your speech down, right? slow your speech down. So for example, if you have an important meeting or presentation or where you need to speak and you're feeling, bam, your heart's pumping, you're getting nervous, breathe before and during more frequently and more fully, keep breathing and start super slow. Start super slow. You don't have to be monotone. You can inflect you can modulate your voice. You can use body language. This is what we teach in our proactive speaking skills. So you can start super slow. You can have those nice little pauses there. You can extend your words. When you extend your words, it's slowing your speech down. But what this does is this counteracts your propensity to rush and to go fast, right? To breathe out through the mouth and not through the nose. Yes. We'll talk about that in just a second. Thank you for that question. So when you're extending your words, you're forcing yourself to slow your speech down. You're allowing yourself to speak smoother. Remember when I told you the person came and said, your voice is so smooth. Well, I thought my voice felt like it was trembling. But to the people out there, it wasn't. It was smooth. This happened to me two other times, right? People said, oh, your voice sounds like Barry White. Your voice... I've, um, I felt like my voice was trembling, but because I was breathing and extending, it made my voice come off as being smooth, okay? So when you extend your words, you slow yourself down, you smooth out your voice, you have more control over your speech and over yourself, 
All right. Now I'm just going to add something else that you want to do, if possible, is you want to use your body, move your hands, use your face, your eyebrows, smile if you can, use your head, move. Don't just stiffen up, because if you just stiffen up and you stay tight, that's one of the characteristics of an amygdala hijacking, right? Stiffen up, tight, all of a sudden, start speeding, stop breathing, right? So you want to move so that you release some of that energy and you're feeling more relaxed. You're relaxing yourself down. So extend your words. B E. Remember, these are the two things we're going to focus on for four weeks. Why? Because it'll give you the fastest results, the best results. It will also allow you to access modeling, It'll allow you to start modeling if you can just remember to breathe and extend those words or slow down. Okay. So extend your words. The next thing, if, if I wanted to add something else, I would say you want to start super slow, but then for the remainder of your speech or whatever you're doing, speak slower than normal. Speak slower than you feel comfortable. Speak slower than you think you should because you're trying to counteract, you're counterbalancing, you're counteracting your desire to go fast and hurry up and get through it. And once you start speaking fast, then you start to stumble over your words. You start to get cloudy. Sometimes your breath gets shorter and you just, and often you're not able to clearly articulate what you want to say. Okay. Even if none of that other stuff happens, when you start speaking fast, you're simply not going to be as clear normally as you'd like to be. Okay. So you want to go slower Go slower. Go slower than normal. Now, I've helped probably thousands of people. I'm helping a lady right now. She's an author, and she's getting ready to go do a whole tour. I've helped politicians. I've helped doctors. I've helped all kinds of people uh, with this very advice with these strategies. It's very simple, but when you combine them, it is super effective and it will absolutely work. It will, even if it doesn't get you where you think you want to be, it will be better than where you would be if you didn't do these things. If you didn't breathe, you're going to be done. If you don't slow your speech down, you're going to be done. So make sure that you do these things, right? aware, be aware, hey, you know what, doesn't matter what my body's doing, I can still perform well. Hey, I need to breathe more frequently and more fully leading up, that is before the event, before the experience, as well as during. I need to take deeper breaths and more breaths as I'm speaking. I need to extend my words and maybe pause a little more in the beginning. Then as I get into a nice rhythm, into a nice flow, I still need to go slower than I usually would. I still don't need to go what I would perceive as my normal speed, because guess what? When you're in that kind of a situation, your normal speed is going to be too fast. Just trust me. Don't speak at your normal rate because it's not a normal situation, right? You want to speak a bit slower than you feel like you should. Like you're, you're feeling like I'm going a bit too slow. I think I'm going too slow. Don't matter if they're rushing you. I mean, it doesn't matter if they're rushing you or you take your time because if you speak at their pace or you allow them to rush you, it's only going to hurt you. It's not going to hurt them. You're the one who's not going to be able to articulate your thoughts as smoothly, as clearly, as confidently as you would like. You're not going to project that authority that you want. You're not going to be able to articulate your knowledge. So don't let them pull you into it. It doesn't matter if it's your boss or the VP, or pre you speak at the rate you need to speak at to perform at your best, at your highest, all right? And then go slower than you feel like you should. Super important. So uh, let's answer a few questions for you. Then I'll do a very, very, very quick review so that you understand what happened, why it happened, and what to do. So one question here, um, it's important to breathe out through your through the mouth and not through the nose, what's the logic behind this? Now, you could 
breathe out through your nose. Like when I'm running, I like to breathe in through my nose and out through my nose because it allows me to run longer. Some people breathe in through their nose and out through their mouth. So it really depends. Uh, I think it has something to do with your ability to get more oxygen in at a a slightly slower rate when you're breathing in through the nose, right? And then to get that exhalation out a bit faster without drying out your mouth. So if you're breathing in through your mouth, most people will find that the mouth gets drier. But when you're breathing out through the mouth, it just feels like you're getting a better exhalation, a more fuller exhalation than if you breathe out through the nose, which when I'm running, I want to do that. I don't want all the air to go out as quickly as what I would if I'm doing a deep breathing exercise. Can you do both? Can you breathe in through your nose and out through your nose? Absolutely. If that works for you, then you can do it. But you'll find that uh, most people who are teaching breathing exercises recommend in through the nose and out through the mouth. And we can do some more research on this. And I'm sure that, in fact, I know there are some additional reasons, expanded reasons, scientific reasons of why it's better to breathe out through your mouth. But for now, just trust me, when you're doing these exercises, it's probably better to breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth, okay? Now, uh, someone else says, not not understand on extending your words. So, Again, other words that people use are stretching your words. And I'll just show you an example. Stretching or elongating or prolongating. These are all other words that you may have heard of. Extending. Just think, when you extend something, what do you do? When you extend your warranty, you make it longer. If you extend a rubber band, if you extend your arms, you're making it wider. You're making it longer. That's all that it means. You're making the word stretch out longer, longer. You're making it longer. That's all that it means. Okay. All right. Through affirmations, are we teaching amygdala not to confuse presentations with the real threat? Great question. Through affirmations, through self-talk, through visualization, uh, I created something called verbalization. So through verbalizations and through mindfulness, as well as breathing, as well as breathing. You're training your amygdala to not see a presentation as a threat, to not see an important conversation as a threat. You're also training your body to handle that because your body sees it as a stressful situation. So your body immediately goes into action. So you're training your body to counteract that. Even if your body does it, you can counteract it. So through affirmations, self-talk, self-talk is really, really important, especially in the moment. Now, I'm going to add a strategy here and it has to do with self-talk. One thing that you can do leading up to, as well as during, is you can talk to yourself and tell yourself, hey, uh, this is no big deal. Or even if it is a big deal, it's better for me to focus on, and I'll just share this with you, on Vic and Rick rather than focusing on the possibility that I might fail or be embarrassed or that I'm being judged. So let me add this other strategy, and that is to shift your focus to Vic and Rick. Now, what's Vic and Rick? It's in the the self-study. You've heard me also talk about it in many of my free videos, so you can go back. But Vic and Rick, the V stands for value, the R in Rick stands for relevancy, the I stands for impact, and the C stands for clarity. So briefly, it means... When you're in, for example, an interview or presentation, when I say presentation, it could be just a meeting where you need to share some information, an update, right? So it doesn't have to be a standing presentation, but just where you need to present your thoughts and ideas. You want to focus on, is what I'm saying relevant? Is it important? Is it value? Is it valuable? Does it add value to this conversation? Is it giving them what they need to know at this time? Am I the eye. Am I holding their attention by the way that I'm speaking, right? This is where modeling comes in and proactive speaking skills. Am I being clear? That is, am I speaking clearly where people can hear me? They can understand I'm not going too fast, not going too slow. 
I'm not speaking too high, not speaking too low, right? I'm not mumbling. People can hear me. And have I structured my thoughts clearly so that it's logical? People can follow the logical flow of what I'm saying, right? So when you focus on Vic and Rick while you're speaking, you're not focusing on those other things, being embarrassed, failing, and being judged. You can't focus on that and focus on Vic and Rick at the same time. So what happens is by training yourself through this self-talk, right? So it's a self-talk that can be going on in the moment, in the moment. Wow, is, is this valuable? Is this helpful? Uh, am I holding their attention? Am I being clear? Right? You're telling yourself this. You're taking control. You're counteracting that amygdala hijacking. I've done this for years and years and years, and I still do it. It's, now it's subconscious. It's automatic, right? So automatically I'm focused on, is this relevant? Is this valuable? Am I holding their attention? Is this clear? It's just automatic. So you want to make this kind of thing automatic. So great question. I hope I answered it. Um, please, should the breathing be in and out, in and out, be done on a slower pace? Or, so when you do a count, for example, like the 777, which is only one breathing exercise, there's many, many others, right? But you're breathing in at that count of seven. So you're, you've got to slow your breathing down, which allows you to take control. You don't want to take all the air in real fast and let it out. You want to breathe in at a slower pace because it allows you to take in more oxygen at a slower rate, giving you greater control of your breathing. When you have control over your breathing, you're breathing in at a slower pace, you're releasing at a slower pace, you find that you're able to relax easier and faster. Okay, so generally speaking, yes, you want to take in your breath, unless you're running or you exercise, then you're going to be breathing a bit faster. All right, I tend to stutter more when I try to do some of these techniques because I focus more on if I'm doing the techniques right and I get tense. So some people tend, and I'm not saying this in a, a negative way, you tend to overthink things, right? What you want to do is... When you're in the situation, you want to practice the technique, but you also want to focus on the Vic and Rick. The Vic and Rick is like taking the spotlight off yourself and saying, it's not about me, it's about them. It's not about me, it's about them, or it's about this person. You take the spotlight off yourself and shine it on that person or on the audience. So you don't want to get caught up in your own mind. Am I doing this right? Am I doing that right? No, just breathe. Breathe more frequently. You don't have to, am I doing the seven, seven, seven? No, just breathe in more frequently and make sure that you're breathing a bit deeper and make sure that you're slowing your speech down. Don't worry about if it's perfect. Now, this is where, and we don't want to get into this now, but this is where practice on a daily basis comes in. Because the more you practice it on a daily basis, the more familiar your body becomes with that particular technique or that strategy or that skill. Okay, So if you just try to use it in the situation, a lot of times it just, it just doesn't work. But if you're practicing it every day, you're practicing it at no pressure situations, medium pressure, high pressure, you become more familiar with this is anything, anything that you want to learn you got to familiarize yourself with it so that when the pressure is on, your body's able to do it. It knows what to do. So my advice is don't overthink it. When you're in a situation, just remember to breathe. Breathe more. Breathe more frequently. Breathe deeper. Slow yourself down. Self-talk. Right. Remind yourself to focus on what you should be focused on. Is this relevant? Is this valuable? Am I holding their attention? Am I being clear? That's it. Nothing else. Don't overthink it. Just do that. With, when, it's, when it comes to modeling and you're practicing modeling, you practice it so it becomes automatic. Then you can just do it, right? All right. So do you breathe in via the diaphragm, then the chest all the time? So no, I probably don't do it all the time. Sometimes I'll do a combination of diaphragm, diaphragmatic breathing and chest breathing. Like that time I just did diaphragm and well, mostly chest breathing, right? Because my diaphragm actually went in. But diaphragmatic breathing means my stomach goes out. 
chest might go a little bit, but stomach goes out. So no, I don't do it all the time, unfortunately. Um, and that is something that I'm also working on uh, in terms of mindfulness and doing more diaphragmatic breathing. So just being honest, no, I don't do it all the time. But I do breathe more frequently and more fully when I need to. And sometimes I'm not aware of whether or not it's diaphragmatic or chest, but I'm breathing. <laughs> okay. All right. Hijack has no connection with adrenal secretions. If yes, are the same method can be used to stop the hijacking. Uh, can you rephrase your question? I'm trying to understand it. If yes, are the same method can be used to stop the hijack? Has hijacked has no connection with adrenal secretions. Yeah, restate that. I'm not understanding it. Um, are you saying that, are you saying that when the amygdala hijacks your brain, your prefrontal cortex, that in fact it doesn't secrete adrenaline. Is, is that what you're saying? Because, yeah, I'm just going to ask you uh, rather than assume that that is what you're saying. So restate your question for me. All right, any other questions while I wait on Emmanuel to, to kind of rephrase what's... Any other questions? And let's just do a quick review of what happens here. All right. So we talked about amygdala hijacking, right? We're saying that the job of the amygdala is to kind of scan your environment for potential threats and that it, in today's time, can perceive a potential threat as something like a presentation or ordering something or an important conversation or an interview, right? It can perceive that as a threat and can hijack, call it fight or flight, right? Fight or flight, stress reaction. It can hijack your prefrontal cortex, your thinking brain, and cause you to respond or react in ways where your thinking gets cloudy, you don't remember what you wanna say, you might freeze up, you might just completely forget, or you might not clearly articulate what you want to say. You might remember some of it or someone asks you a question, right? So sometimes a person will ask you a question and you know the answer, you just you can't access it in that moment. So all these things can happen. You can speed up, right? You can start to speed. So perceived threats, right? Embarrassed, judgment, failure activates the amygdala, releases hormones, obviously releases more, but these are the two main ones, cortisol and adrenaline, right? Boom, get your body ready to fight, to flee, in some cases to just freeze. And then it hijacks the prefrontal cortex, starts pulling resources to go to different parts of your body. And then it can impair your performance, meaning you simply don't perform as well as you could. So first thing, you want to become aware, hey, just because my body's doing this doesn't mean that I can't perform well because my heart could be about to jump on my body, but I can do some things to help myself calm down a bit and still perform well. Now, one thing that I mentioned, but I didn't put it up here, is reframing. So the whole time that you're feeling your body do this, you can simply say, I'm excited. I'm, I'm really excited. Don't say I'm nervous. I'm anxious. Don't think I'm nervous or anxious. Just think I'm excited. I'm really excited about this because the feelings are basically the same, except in one case, it's draining you. I'm anxious. I'm nervous. The other case, it's infusing energy. It's energizing you. When you say I'm excited, it's energizing you. Okay. Uh, so you want to breathe more frequently and more fully, preferably into the nose, out through the mouth. Ex you want to extend your words more, right? You want to go super slow when you're first getting started, super slow, but make sure that you're inflecting so it doesn't sound monotone, right? Super slow. And then for the rest of the time, go slower than you think you should. That doesn't mean you're going to go slow, like dragging on the whole time, just slower than what you think you should. And then you're also going to make sure that you are talking to yourself, that you're reminding yourself, hey, is this relevant? Is this valuable? Am I holding their attention? Am I engaging them? Is this clear? Right. All right. Let me get back. 
um, is extending the same as emphasizing. So when you emphasize, like I just did, when you emphasize, usually you're extending, but not all the time, right? So sometimes I can emphasize something like that, but I didn't extend it. Usually when I emphasize, I do extend. So emphasizing can combine or include extending, inflecting, body language, over articulation, like I just said. It can include all of those things, or it can include just one or two of them. All right. We teach that in the proactive speaking skills. All right. Um, is it logical to work on developing prefrontal cortex also to avoid emotional reaction? So, yeah, when, when you train yourself through, these are just some, through some of the methods that I've shared with you, you're, you're training yourself to respond to stressors in your environment in a much more constructive and effective way. The job of your pre, or one of the jobs of your prefrontal cortex is to, is to, in a sense, tame your amygdala. It's to say, whoa, 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 wait a minute. This is not a real threat, or we don't really need to respond like this, right? So when you use these methods like the breathing and the affirmations and the self-talk, and you do these things, you slow everything down, what you're doing is you're allowing your prefrontal cortex, right? Through this process, you're training yourself, you're developing a habit of being able to take back control or in some ways to prevent the hijacking. Just because your heart rate has gone up doesn't mean you've been hijacked, okay? It doesn't mean that you're going to go cloudy, but it may be the beginning of that process. It can happen instantly or it can be just kind of a process that happens. So yes, by training yourself using these methods, you're giving your prefrontal cortex the resources it needs to manage these kinds of higher pressure, pressure, stressful situations. Okay. I hope that that answered your question. Okay. Other people say hijack can be caused by adrenal secretions. If this is true, or the same methods you mentioned in your presentation can be used to stop it. Be caused by adrenal secretions. If this is true, are the same methods you mentioned in your presentation be used to stop it? If I'm understanding your question, I'm going to say yes. I'm going to say if I'm understanding your question correctly, it can be used to reverse the effects of it. So uh, once once you've been hijacked, which can happen at various levels. Again, it doesn't mean that you're just going to completely go blank. You're not going to be able to do anything. There's degrees of it, right? But once the adrenaline starts pumping, cortisol is out there in the bloodstream. The methods that I've talked about are some very, very common ones, very, very powerful. You're going to hear breathing. You're going to hear mindfulness, which is kind of hard to do when you're in the moment, but you can be more present, which is where Vic and Rick comes in. So yeah, these methods can be used to begin to take back control, to calm the body down, to lower the blood pressure, to lower the heart rate, right? To begin to send out other chemicals that cause you to become calmer. But once these chemicals are in your system, sometimes they'll stay in there for a while. I don't remember exactly how long, but you can actually use the energy. You can use the energy by reframing and saying, hey, I'm excited, I'm excited, right? So you channel that energy as opposed to letting it take control. Does that make sense? So it's in your system. You feel hyped up. You feel souped up. Use that energy to speak proactively, to speak dynamically, to interact with your audience. Use the energy. Channel the energy. Focus the energy as opposed to letting it take control. So breathing slowing everything down, using your body, extending your words, allows you to channel the energy as opposed to stiffening, not breathing much, right? And going real fast, you're not channeling the energy and you, you could get yourself into trouble, okay? All right, hopefully I've answered all your questions, okay? This is the kind of stuff that if you're watching this now, or if you're watching this later, this is one of those webinars. And all the webinars, I try to give you very, very practical uh, techniques or strategies uh, or skills or habits. 
this is very practical. The research is out there. The science is out there. So you can go check it because I have, right? And these are very, very simple things that you can do. Like if you have a meeting today, you can do this immediately and it can help you perform better. Remember, all these things you have to develop into a habit, right? It's got to become a skill of yours. It's got to become a habit. So you have to practice it when there's no pressure, low pressure, and high pressure. You have to practice it so that you and your body, your brain and your body becomes familiar with doing it. So the first time you try it, it may work great or it may not work, but that doesn't mean it doesn't work. It just means you're not familiar with it yet. So you just have to keep doing it until you become. But often, if you just remember, hey, I'm in control of my breathing. It doesn't matter what my body's doing. I can breathe. I can take breaths. I can take deeper breaths. I can slow my speech down. It doesn't matter if I'm getting stuck, if I'm having a hard time, if I've got to use different words, whatever. I can slow my speech down, right? I can move my body so I can slow everything down, which is going to be better than just pushing stuff out and going fast and allowing your body to just take over. So keep that in mind. All right. Very helpful webinar. Thank you for your hard work. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, everyone who's here today. Thank those of you who will be watching this. Uh, you're going to get some emails. I want to strongly encourage you to register if you feel like it's a good fit for this 30-day intensive. It's an opportunity for you to work with me but specifically on these two things. We're not going to work on presentations or anything. We're just going to work on the breathing, getting you to the point where you're breathing a certain way and when you're able to extend your words. And that is the focus. The good thing is that if you decide that you want to upgrade into the regular coaching within 60 days, so you got your 30 days and 30 days after that, I will credit you what you paid for the 30-day intensive. I'll just credit you to whichever program you want, as long as you upgrade if you feel like you need to within 30 days. This is a jumpstart program. Uh, some of you are just, you're going to want to jump right into the regular coaching, and you can find a link for that there. That button should be there. Some of you will want to start with the self-study. You get $100 off if you want to start with that. Hey there, my name is Michael Williams, Pro90 G founder and smooth speech coach. Are you tired of struggling with your speech? Ready to transform your life and boost your confidence? Then it's time for you to enroll in my Pro90 D private laser focus coaching program. What I can only say is thanks. I'm due to Pro90 D and Michael and the support and how he's just changed my life and my speech. I honestly think that if not for the laser focused coaching with Michael, I wouldn't be where I am right now. It's just impossible. Don't let speech struggles hold you back. Book your call or enroll today. Let's take the first step towards a smoother, more confident you. Let's do it together. Book your call or enroll today.